A Warhammer Novel Kinslayer Gotrick and Felix, Volume 13 Written by David Geimer The world is dying, but it has been so since the coming of the Chaos Gods. For years beyond reckoning, the ruinous powers have coveted the mortal realm. They have made many attempts to seize it, their anointed champions leading vast hordes into the lands of men, elves and dwarves. Each time they have been defeated. Until now. In the frozen north, Archaeon, a former Templar of the warrior god Sigmar, has been crowned the ever-chosen of Chaos. He stands poised to march south and bring ruin to the lands he once fought to protect. Behind him amass all the forces of the Dark Gods, mortal and demonic. When they come, they will bring with them a storm such as has never been seen. Already the lands of men are falling into ruin. Archaon's vanguard ran riot across Kislev. The once proud country of Bretonia has fallen into anarchy, and the southern lands have been consumed by a tide of verminous ratmen. The men of the Empire, the elves of Ulfuan, and the dwarves of the World's Edge Mountains fortify their cities and prepare for the inevitable onslaught. They will fight bravely and to the last, but in their hearts all know that their efforts will be futile. The victory of chaos is inevitable. These are the end times. Knowing the object of the Slayer's quest as I do, I have never labored under the illusion that our friendship, if you could call it that, would last forever. Indeed, we might both have had cause to bemoan ill fortune that our association had lasted as long as it did, when Godric and I finally parted ways. Many was the cold night that I had lain awake and dreamed of the day I would be free of my oath, and looking back I cannot blame myself for taking the chance of a settled life for myself and Cat when it was offered. And yet, it is only human to wonder what hurt might have been spared had we all left Karakadren together that day. The truth that I cling to is that our paths have always seemed guided by unseen powers, with a great destiny in mind. For how could a dwarf so determined to seek death have survived so much? Does this mean that I can forgive him for what we did in Kislev? Though I try, I cannot. Perhaps I write this too soon after the event, but the end times are upon us, and I fear that the grief will not fade in the short time we have left. From My Travels with Gotrek, Unpublished, by Herr Felix Jäger Prologue, Autumn 2524 It can't be done, said Gotrek flatly, scooping up his tankard and sitting back challenging the Longbeard to convince him he was wrong. Borek Forkbeard took a moment to consider his reply. It was not a way of Longbeards to be hurried, and particularly not over so important a matter as this. The old dwarf sat quietly, thinking, polishing the lenses of his spectacles with one white fork of his beard, while the bustle of the inn went on around him. It was rough and dirty, and the patrons were no cleaner. The dwarves here were farmers, herders, and miners of what little lead and tin was to be found in this part of the world's edge mountains. The longest faces were worn by a party of prospectors consoling themselves with a last drink before making the short return to Karaza Karak. Through the open doors and windows, the grassy foothills baked in sunshine. Goats and hogs dotted the hillside. The Skull River was a sliver of sparkling light between the two hills on the western horizon. Gotrek sipped his bugmans. Borek was neither poor nor shy with his wealth, content to wait on the Longbeard's mind. Snorri Nosebiter, however, had never been so patient. Snorri does not know what there is to think about. Snorri wouldn't, said Gotrek. Godrek and Snorri will both be famous and rich. Famous, maybe, said Godrek. The famous fools who thought they could ride into the chaos wastes, find a dwarf old two centuries lost, and return with her treasure. I will be famous, all right. He took another mouthful of Bogmans, then snorted and turned to Borek. 
And may shame find you, Forkbeard, for putting such ideas into this Wazak's head. He is a miner, not a warrior, and his mother wouldn't even let him as far as ever peek for the ore market. Boric blinked at the rebuke, then cleared his throat and reset his pince-nez on the nose. This expedition is not without peril, you are correct, but it can be done. Every precaution has been taken. These wagons of yours, said Gautrek, sounding particularly unimpressed. I, you mentioned. Protected by steel and rune, and driven by the power of steam alone. The longbeard nodded to Snorri. We have plenty of strong arms and stout hearts, but I need good engineers in each wagon to keep the convoy together through all the madness of the wastes. He removed his glasses again and fixed Godric with a stare, as if laying down a challenge. Snorri tells me you are one of the best. Ah, Snorri tells you, Godric muttered. Do it, urged Snorri. It will be just like your adventures with Hamnir, only with Snorri. It is different now, and you know it, said Godric although from the wistfulness in the tone it was clear he was not at all sure of his position as he wanted to be. I have a family to consider. Will you at least promise to think about it? said Borek. Snorri grinned hopefully. Godric scowled into his beer and drank. Fine, I'll think about it. Snorri stared into his empty tankard and let the earnest talk of Casa Drengi, the slayer's hole of Karakadrin, break upon the huge bulwark of his shoulders. He put his knuckles into his temple and rapped on the bar for the attention of the steward. His memory was coming back. He was going to need another beer. Part 1. Old Friends. Autumn, Midwinter, 25-24. Lost. Snow fell across the oblast in thumb-sized flakes, white-furred reavers of the frozen north. Where exactly these raiders ravaged, Marzalek Stefan Tagzak could not say, for this was the time of the Raspotitsa, of roadlessness, when hills, rivers, and whole stanitsas sank under a plain of featureless white. The remnants of the Dushikarota reigned in on either side, reduced by the blizzard to little more than mounted shades. Nine men. That what was left of the cavalry pulk he had led into battle at Tobol Crossing. Nine men. Nine beaten men. They rode slumped in the saddle, swathed but for their eyes in bloodstained cloaks and captured Kurgan furs. Their animal layers were flecked with white, like a froth of exhaustion but a numbness of the heart and body meant no man shivered. It was that same fatalism that granted each man a shot of satisfaction, like Kumis still warm from a mare's teeth, at the fate that winter would soon share with the Northmen. Raspotitsa returned the herdsman and the hunter to his Tirsa, the merchant to his city, and the warrior to his hearth, but to an army on the march it was death. As fiercely as Stefan wished to see the closing of the year in such terms, he could not. There were no victors when Lord Winter marched to war. Thirty Kurgan, Marzalek, all dead. Stefan's Esol, a beef and gristle man named Kolia, reigned in his steed beside him. The mare, Kashtanka, responded numbly and Kolia clapped vigor into her neck and snow from her mane. He looked to Stefan. Blood flecked his blue eyes. He nodded once to the scene of butchery that had led Stefan to call a halt. In the lee of a rough horseshoe of banked snow, bodies and parts lay scattered around a doused fire pit. A thin sheen of ice glimmered from the bodies where their warmth had melted the snow. Now they were cold. The snow slowly covered them, smothering the butcher's ruin as blindly as it did roads and tirsas and the hideous skull dolmens of the Kurgan. This had happened recently. They were gaining. The same as before, Stefan muttered. Not a battle, but a massacre. This was not war as he understood it. 
What did this? Kolya offered a no-matter shrug. As the wise woman would say, Marzalek, when the winter is hard, the wolf will eat wolf. In the privacy of his face scarf, Stefan smiled. It was easy to forget the huntsman who had used to paint stick horses on stones to scatter wherever one of the oblast spirits had spooked poor, skittish Kashtanka. They were half-brothers, a blood relation as common as widowed mothers, and it was good to remember that the oblast had not always been this way. The Northmen had come many times, and always they were driven back. Kislev was the land, and the land was Kislev. Stefan looked up and squinted into the icicle teeth of the blizzard. The snow-swept vista stretched to the ends of his experience and beyond. It had suffered a grievous wound, maybe more than one, but to him it still looked like Kislev. Kolya made a clicking sound under his tongue and brought Kastanka around to the right. She whinnied shyly, jumping into the high snow before settling into a walk, as Kolya guided her around the edge of the Kurgan camp. There were more bodies, scattered, a breadcrumb trail leading north. Some of the Northmen had tried to flee from whatever it was that had caught up with them. It had done them no good, though. They had been beheaded, dismembered, taken apart by a monster so far beyond the abilities of an entire marauder warband that there was no evidence of it anywhere. Stefan fixed on a severed hand, half buried in the snow. A hand axe was gripped in the bluing fingers. He felt kind of a gratitude for that. Many of the Northman tribes shared the Norse belief that a warrior spirit would forever roam unless he died with weapon in hand. The north wind turned then, skirting the Northmen's horseshoe wall and blasting both their faces with snow. It carried the coppery, obscenely sweet odor of recent death. The horses snorted anxiously. Kastanka stamped her hooves and whinnied until Bigots, Stefan's mount and a stablemate since birth nuzzled its old companion and blew reassurance into her ear. Men of the southern cries liked to mock the bond between a noblas man and his horse, but few men loved an animal as Kolya loved Kastanka. It was her, rather than his own blood brother, that was keeping the bold man Stefan had known alive. Marzalek! The shout cut through the blizzard with little warning of the horseman who cantered through, then reared to a standstill in a flurry of snow. Boris Makoski was younger than Stefan, had been a trapper making a decent living selling meat and fur to merchants in Prague before the incursion, but defeat had aged him now. There was grey in his fringe, and something feral never far beneath the surface when he spoke. Even when he didn't, it was there in his eyes if a man was brave enough to look. There are tracks that continue north. It is too heavy to be a man, but whatever else it may be, it is a beast on two legs. Can you not tell what it is from the tracks? said Kolya. An ogre mercenary that fled the fall of Volksgrad, maybe. One of the trolls that the Kurgan say now occupy Prague. We have seen wars migrating south. But these tracks head north said Stefan. They follow the same warband as we do. Makoski shrugged angrily. What I can tell I have told. If you want more, then speak to Bochenek. That stung. The Rota scout was feeding the foxes of the last Stanitsa they had found. The price paid for spotting the Kurgan ambush too late. Stefan said nothing. On the oblast, a man learned to conserve warmth any way he could and that included keeping his mouth shut when words were not welcome. Instead, he glanced again to the ruined corpses, worrying what such a monster might do to the captives the Kurgan had taken with them. The capture of the wise woman, Marzena, who had clearly exhausted her good fortune when Kolya and Bochenek had heard her screams and rescued her from the beastman herd that had invaded her home in the Shirokish forest, had hurt all of them, but Kolya most of all. His brother had always been the one to seek out omens in the shape of clouds, to besiege the spirits before partaking of a spring, and to heed the wisdom of the Ungol hags. Stefan shook his head grimly. Snow dropped out of his brow. What kind of beast, though, would render such carnage and not even pick at the bodies it left behind? 
Stefan did not like the inevitable option Dad had left. Demon. He shuddered, reaching for the sabla scabbarded by his left stirrup. A man may seem brave when fighting sheep, said Kolya, quoting another of Marzena's proverbs. But be a sheep when faced with brave men. Stefan drew himself upright in the saddle to regard his brother fully. I speak of the monster, not you, said Kolya, the memory of a smile haunting his thin lips. These men were frostbitten and half-starved. Their war leader had left them behind while the bulk of the host continued north. He indicated the direction with a nod. We ride on. For our lost brothers, said Stefan, spurring his mount around to face north. I will not leave any man in the hands of the Kurgan, and I certainly won't abandon an old woman. Kolya nodded, but Makoski's scowl merely darkened. The man seemed to come alive only when in the heat of the hunt. The land was wide, with too few beastmen to be found roaming lost and starving on the steppe. Usually they were ridden down with relish. Other times they were made to pay for what they had wrought upon Kislev. Nothing that Stefan could think of short of a victory, however small, or the remote possibility of reuniting with the Ice Queen's Pulk would rally his men's hopes. We are gaining, said Kolya, then raised a hand to sweep over the dead. His manner was grim, barren of hope and glad for it. These men will not miss their furs now. When the horses are rested, we will bring the vengeance of Dushika onto the Kurgan and their pursuer both. Tell me of your adventures in Prague, said the black robed priest of Grimnir, walking barefoot through the soot and steam of Grimnir's foundry, deep in the walls of Karakadren. The air was thick and black. It tickled the throat with the honest taste of coal and cushioned the clangor of hammer upon anvil and the hiss of bellows. Shrouded with their bare arms in the murk, visions of Grimnir himself at a fabled forge, a score of dwarves worked their anvils with a single mightiness that bordered on brutal. Their straining muscles crawled with tattoos and coursed with sweat. Not one of them spoke. It was just them, the iron, and the sanctity of the forge. Snorri Nosebiter said nothing, for it was an old question, and merely watched as the priest padded in a circle behind his back, Snorri twisting in his chair to follow his progress as far as he could. The snap of taut leather arrested him and pulled him back into the chair. Oh, yes, Snorri kept forgetting about that. He was secured into a high-backed wooden chair, and though it took a lot of leather to strap in a chest as massive as Snorri's, the priest was taking no chances. The stump of his right leg was laid upon the anvil in front of him. He remembered that his old friend Gotrek Gurnison had cut it off for him. He grinned in success at having remembered that, but then almost immediately frowned. Was he happy about that? Clearly he was still missing something. Snorri, the priest prodded, circling back around to the front. He wore his black hair long and his beard forked, and walked with his hands clasped behind him as he spoke. He wielded his voice with an authority as unsubtle as Snorri's hammer. His bare feet slapped the hot floor. I asked you a question. Snorri maintained his frown. He was here to remember, that much he knew. Deep thoughts scrunched up his face. It was unique, even as faces went. It had taken so many beatings that bony regrowths nobbled his jawline, and his nose was flattened between the cheeks. One ear was a cauliflowered mess, while the other had been torn away to leave a pinhole in the side of his head. Sometimes, when things got boring, Snorri could hear air whistling through it. What kind of name is Scalf Hammertoes, anyway? said Snorri. I was a ranger, and not a very good one. I do not hide from my shame as some might. He looked askance towards Snorri. Now, Prague. Snorri does not remember. I think that you do. Snorri watched the priest circle behind him again. It was making him dizzy. 
he closed his eyes to think. Prague. He had traveled there with Godric and his young friend Felix on the airship, the Spirit of Grungni, to fight chaos. The fighting had been all right, but he hadn't enjoyed the journey much. There had been too much time with nothing to do but think. Snorri did not like thinking. It did not agree with him. It gave him memories. As he fought back, now back past that point, his mind flinched like a dog from an old master who had once been cruel. There was an old wound which was still buried there despite the years he spent trying to forget. And now he was supposed to remember. Why? Because he had promised. That was why. He saw a dwarf woman and a child. He did not remember if the child was his, but the regret, the anguish, that knotted in his chest at a memory, told him that he had loved these two as if they were. The knot tightened. His heart was a dead weight on his lungs. He had killed them both. Or had he? But their deaths had been his fault. Yes, that was right. He could not remember. Interesting, said Skalf, checking his stride. Snorri opened his eyes, blinking as if he had just had his head submerged in a barrel. The priest's lips twisted in amusement. You talk when you think, Snorri knows biter. I can only assume it is that thick skull of yours that has seen you through so many battles. Snorri beamed. I want you to tell me about the second time you visited that city, when you returned there without Gurnison and the human. It was around then that your memory began to fail. The priest snorted at some private joke, and Snorri bristled. This beardling priest was mocking him. By what Grimnir given right? Something about being asked a question, though, made his mind go there. His skull ached. The three brightly colored nails that had been hammered into his head in place of the traditional slayer crest were throbbing. Pain threatened to flush his mind of hard memories, but he grunted and willed himself past it. He had made a promise. He owed Godric that much. Godric and young Felix disappeared into a magic door. When Max could not find them, then he and Snorri went back to Prague to fight chaos some more. This is Maximilian Schrieber, your wizard friend. Max is the wisest human Snorri knows. One time Snorri fell asleep in a bucket of vodka, and when he woke up, Max made his sore head go away. Then perhaps he is not that wise, Skulf snapped for a hangover is Grimnir's way of making the last night's fools suffer. The priest took a deep breath and went on. What did you and Max do in Prague? Uh... Snorri vaguely recalled the following summer as a sequence of disappointing skirmishes with beastmen and marauders, with just the one halfway memorable battle with a champion somewhere upriver. But he couldn't really remember that either. Then there had been that incident with the demon-possessed violin, that even after he had sobered up, Snorri thought was rather unlikely. Max was not the kind to make up that kind of thing, though. Not at all like that young rascal Felix. He remembered being sad to have missed it. Then he remembered something that he had not before. Ulrika was there too, Snorri thinks. The Zanguzas? Oh, she wasn't a vampire then, said Snorri, and then paused to think. At least, uh... Doubt, said Skalf, with a grim half-smile. He unclasped his hands from behind his back, and then laid them flat on the anvil by the stump of Snorri's leg. He leaned forward. His eyes were a hawkish amber. Doubt is progress, and progress is good. I think you have always wanted to forget. Snorri thinks this priest is stupider than Snorri. Godric and his rememberer were unique individuals, Scalf pressed. They were possessed of a destiny I cannot pretend to understand. Their quest swept you along, Snorri, allowed you to forget your pain. 
but then one day they were gone, and you were left alone. Snorri tried to pull away. There was a leather moan, and a strap buckle bit into his massive forearm. Of course, Snorri thought miserably. Snorri forgot. Pain is like gold. However deep you try to bury it, someone will always dig it up again. Snorri thinks... Snorri thinks he would like a beer now, or ten. Of course you would, said Scalf. He gestured towards someone that Snorri couldn't see. Snorri smacked his lips. They would probably be bringing beer. Another slayer strode through the smoke. He wore his hair in two crests, sharp red horns at the front, but shaved down to the scalp at the back. His bare, muscular torso was a web of red and black tattoos. It looked like the musculature of a flayed body. But not a dwarf's, though, Snorri realized, as the slayer's face emerged from the smoke, painted into the snarling visage of a demon. Snorri instinctively grabbed for a weapon, causing the chair to rattle. Acknowledging neither Snorri nor Skelf, the demon slayer dropped a large leather bag on the anvil. It hit with an iron clank. The bag was open, and Snorri glanced inside. In among the common hammers and tongs of the smith's craft, there rested an oddly proportioned spiked mace. There were no spikes at the very head of the weapon, and there was no grip at all. The end of the handle where it should have been was flat and smooth and skirted with triangular iron flips that were each punched through with eyelets. But nowhere in amongst it did Snorri see his beer. Snorri wants to know what you two are up to. The demon slayer laid his palm on Snorri's shoulder. Burning, bleeding ligaments and sinews crawled across the well-muscled arm, but the touch was not unkind. I owe you a debt, Snorri Nosebiter. Snorri will take your word for it. As you should, for my word is iron, spoke the demon slayer retrieving his hand so he could devote both to removing the mace from his bag and laying it reverently upon the anvil. Hammer and nails followed, and the demon slayer then positioned the smoothed flat haft of the mace up against the stump of Snorri's leg. It was surprisingly warm, and was a suspiciously good fit. Snorri had a very bad feeling about it. He hoped he was going to get his beer sooner rather than later. That warm-eaten peg that the humans gave you to replace your leg is hardly fit for a son of Grungni, said Skalf, but Snorri was having difficulty focusing on him. His gaze led to where the demon slayer was making a ring of measured little guide necks around his leg by scoring an iron nail through the meat. Surely the shame of it was the reason you refused your old companion, Mackaison, and remained here while he joined King Ironfist Throng for the march to Sylvania. Or could there be some other reason? Snorri cannot remember. Skulf snarled. It was the wrong answer. The von Karsteins rise again, Snorri. All the bloodsuckers. The king aligned himself with elves, elves, to fight them. He looked to the ceiling and presented his open palms in dismay. Many slayers found their dooms there in that mighty defeat. Even MacIson did not return. Skalf nodded to the demon slayer, who then picked up a nail and threaded it through one of the eyelets at the junction of the mace leg. It dug into Snorri's thigh. The demon slayer lined up his hammer. My name is Durin Drakvar he muttered. I owe you my life and my death. On the last halls of home, I will see that you find yours. This is going to hurt, said Skalf. Can Snorri not have a beer first? Skalf stuffed a rolled up leather belt into Snorri's mouth. You already had too much. That is the problem. From the corner of his eye, Snorri saw Durin swing his hammer. He tightened his eyes, bit down on the belt, and grunted, 
as the demon slayer took his time striking nails from the eyelets of the mace leg and into his thigh. The hammering from the nearby slayers proceeded unabated, as if they didn't even hear. When it was done, Durin laid a hand briefly on Snorri's shuddering shoulder, then diligently wiped up a few spatters of blood and put away his tools. Tell me of your spider lady, said Skalf, quietly pulling the bell from Snorri's mouth as though nothing had just happened. Snorri is going to kill you when he gets out of this chair. There is nothing darker than a kinslayer, said Skalf calmly. Even threatening it is enough to earn your name in blood in a clan's book of grudges. The priest shrugged. Lucky for you, I have no family. Now, answer my question. Snorri tried to think about something else, but couldn't stop his mind going where it was bidden. Woods, giant spiders in the trees, an old lady screaming. Snorri saved an old lady in the woods, big spiders attacking her. Snorri killed them all. Slow down, said Skalf. Take a breath. Snorri did as he was told and found that it helped. They stung Snorri a lot, and when he woke up, the old lady told him he would not die yet. She said Snorri would have a great doom, just like Gotrax. And this destiny, is it to be found here in the Temple of Grimnir? Maybe said Snorri, disfigured brow nodding in concentration. The old lady in the woods had said more, been more specific than he remembered, but it was gone now. An old lady standing over him. She is sad. You will have the mightiest doom. Even though it made his head hurt, he tried to remember. He had made a promise. The harder he tried to remember, though, the harder it seemed to be, like swatting a fly with a hammer. Thoughts of his supposed destiny always carried him near the memories of his shame, as if they were connected somehow. He wondered what Godric would do. They had been friends since before either of them had taken the Slayer Oath. Perhaps he and Godric would both meet their ends together. That would be nice. It would make up for... for... He winced, his crest of nails throbbing in the roof of his brain. Snorri can't remember. The priest stroked his beard thoughtfully, took a considered breath, and then directed a nod to Durin Drakvar. Snorri watched as the demon slayer produced a massive pair of tongs. Durin studied the straps holding Snorri down. These will not hold him. With a nod, the priest turned and whistled into the smoke. The two nearest slayers looked up from their anvils, and then down tools and started towards them. Each took one of Snorri's arms, and at a hand gesture from Skalf, one of them put a hand over Snorri's brow to hold steady his hand. The iron bite of Durin's tongues approached from behind, followed by a yawning silence, and then a pressure on the skull as the tongues clamped into the first of Snorri's nails. Not those, Snorri moaned. He strained against the two massive dwarves, but they had him pinned. All he could do was move his eyes. They rolled up to fix the demon slayer with a pleading gaze. Please! Forgive me, Durin whispered, but I owe you too steep a debt. Grimnir takes sacrifice in the blood of his slayers, whispered Skalf. Malachi has gone. Godric has gone. It has been over a year now, Snorri, and still you cannot or will not recall. The priest nodded to the other slayers to begin. And now Grimnir demands his due. It was for your own good, Durin growled over the low murmur of grim talk that permeated the pipe smoke of Casa Drengi. He glared straight down into the iron jug of ale that he circled with his hands. Red ink picked out the tendons, and black emphasized the shadow. It was as though a demon of blood and bone sought to crush that tankard with its bare hands. 
The Demon Slayer did not drink, and Snorri regarded both him and the dwarf's ale with equal glumness. Tentatively, he ran a hand across his head. His fingers brushed piggish grey bristle, and he winced as they passed over the scabbed-up punctures where his crest had been ripped out. It hurt as though he had prematurely jumped out of a gyrocopter and had been scalped by the spinning blades. He glared at Durin, dunking his little finger into the mug of water in front of him and withdrawing it for inspection. His expression soured. Snorri was not feeling especially forgiving just now. At low slung tables all around the hole, slayers were sitting hunched, locked in conversation over the great battles being fought all over the great world, and drinking with the determination of those for whom tomorrow was not a given. The tables were packed, and half a dozen dwarves stood with beers resting on the bar, trading boasts with the bar dwarf for the day, a leather-faced old slayer named Drogun in an ill-fitting white apron. At the other end of the bar, a sullen slab of a dwarf called Brock Balderson dished up meat paste and potatoes from a steaming pot. The hole was busier than Snorri had ever seen it in years, and was filled with unfamiliar faces. It was a sign of the times that Casa Drengi was the last hole in Karakadrin to house more dwarves than it had ever been designed to accommodate. Two tables over, a pair of dwarves built like battlements wrestled arms across the table. Snorri recognized one of them. Kraki Ironhame roared merrily, a large pie in one hand, as he nonchalantly inched his opponent's fist towards the tabletop. The slayer's girth was mammoth, even for a dwarf, and his hair, a natural fiery red, produced a fat, undyed crest. The day the dwarf arrived from Karakhirn on his way north, Snorri had broken his knuckles on that same lucky table. They seemed to be better now, but Kraki didn't appear to have gotten any closer to Kislev. Snorri turned back to Durin. The dwarf still had to touch his drink. It made Snorri angry just thinking about it going to waste. If you choose to dislike me, Snorri, I will understand. But I am trying to help you. Snorri scowled into his mug. Tell Snorri again why he can't have a beard, too. Because Scalf would not untie you until you vow to renounce it, remember? Every word from the Demon Slayer's mouth sounded blank, emptiness colored only by the dimmest gray of regret. It was impossible to hate a dwarf that sounded like that. It would be like trying to hate the dark. Snorri rubbed his head ruefully, and then his throat. He couldn't remember the last time he had been completely sober, but then that had always been the point. Some dwarves got philosophical when they drank, others belligerent, but not Snorri. It made him numb, and that was how he liked it. He shook his head, scratched the grey boar bristles across his scalp as if he could scour the thoughts out of his mind. Then, into that induced emptiness, popped an unrelated thought. He brightened immediately. Snorri remembers the human tavern called the Emperor's Griffin. Human beer doesn't count, does it? It is still beer. So they say, Snorri grumbled. The idea of never having another beer made his throat ache like the Arabian desert, but forever was too big for him to deal with then and there. He wanted a drink now. He glared sulkily over the hard-drinking slayers. If he could not drink, then there was always the possibility of getting hit. The world was an ugly and unjust mistress, and always looked better after Snorri had been hit in the head a couple of times. Cheered by the prospect, he appraised the Casa Drengi with a fresh eye. Brock Balderson had a hard look of an old fighter and Snorri had once seen Kraki punch out a priest of Grimnir with a set of freshly broken knuckles. But the rest were a disappointing bunch of scrawny-looking shortbeards that Snorri wouldn't bet on in a fight with a goblin. He sighed. Snorri hopes he finds his doom very soon. Durin lowered himself to the table until he dropped into Snorri's eyeline. I hope that for us both. I have sworn before the shrine of Grimnir that you will find a worthy end. 
Snorri stared acidly at the other's lair. He was not getting off that easily, not after he had stolen Snorri's nails, and wouldn't even let him have one beer to make up for it. Does that make you Snorri's rememberer, then? Because Snorri doesn't need a rememberer. The demon slayer sat back and picked up his tankard as if considering his words, with the care of a gem cutter over a rare stone. He took a sip, swallowing as if that might be his last. Snorri watched every twitch as it went down his throat. I am not your rememberer, Snorri, though clearly you do need one more than most. I am just a dwarf with a debt. Intrigued now, despite a stubborn will not to be, Snorri waded into the murky stew of his memory. He had journeyed with many slayers in his time, but most had already beaten him to their ends. Rodi Balkison, although the details of it were hazy, had been slain by Krell at Castle Rygard, while his other recent companion, Agrin Crownfinger, had fallen in battle with an entire beastman herd. Grudy Halfhand had taken the orc that had chained him to a worthy end at the bottom of an ale barrel. Further back, memories became sharper and came quicker. Bjorni Bjornison, the selfish bastard, had been cut down by that chaos warlord during the siege of Prague, cheating both Gotrek and Snorri of mighty dooms while he was at it. Uli Ulison had fallen earlier that day. He fought back further. Grimme had been as sour as this slayer, but the red tattoos and air of horror that clung to this one were entirely different. In any case, Snorri distinctly recalled Grimme being incinerated by a dragon, just moments before that dragon had gone on to crush another slayer called Stag. Snorri chuckled. That one had made Snorri laugh. It was a good death. They all had. He sighed. But not for Snorri. I am not surprised that you do not remember me, said Durin, and not just because of your problem. For a moment the dwarf's gaze was distant. His eyes seemed to widen, sinking into the black-inked pits of their sockets. He swirled his ale. There were many of us that you and your companions rescued from Karak Doom that day. Durin looked up to find Snorri staring intently at his face. The demon's face he wore twisted into the first smile Snorri had seen on it. It was not, he decided, something he wanted to see again sober. The face of the destroyer, said Durin. Like you, it is difficult for me to remember. Like you, I must make myself if I am to follow my true path. How long before that which befell Karak Doom is the fate of all? The chaos wastes expand. Already demons are walking freely across the troll country. Durin's words were growing louder and his face hotter as he continued. Behind him there was a crashing of bone into oak and a thunderous eruption of laughter. Durin ignored it. I am leaving for Kislev with you or without you. I will not be here when Karakadrin is caught by the wastes, and be assured it will be. I have lived through that once, and demons will not hunt me from my own holes a second time. Durin was on his feet and panting with emotion. Snorri didn't know what to say. He should probably want to punch him for suggesting Karakadrin might fall. But even Snorri knew that greater holes than her had fallen before and would fall again. Durin Drakvar came from one of them. He shook his head. Tempting as that sounded, he wanted to remember his shame first. He had promised. Except he did not want that at all. He wanted... He hung his head. Valaya's sweet breath. He wanted a beer. Snorri! The shout from the arm wrestler's table startled Snorri from his thoughts. Kraki Ironheim thumped on trunk legs towards them. Grimnir's breeches, he laughed. Did you lose a wager, or did you just walk underneath Malachi's magnetic rune? Ha, you look old without your crest. I barely recognized you. 
The fat dwarf gave Snorri a mighty smack across the back. Snorri's nose wrinkled. Even at the best of times, Kraki smelled like sweaty pork, which had been left out for weeks to marinate in ale. These were not the best of times. But I like the leg. Snorri's mace leg thunked into the flagstones as he remembered it was actually there. Snorri is getting used to it. Kraki's grin slowly faded as he took in the contents of Snorri's mug. What in Gazdul's damnation is this? Snorri sagged miserably into the table. Whoever said that thing about misery and company had definitely not been a slayer. Snorri made an oath. Ah, then maybe I can piss in that mug for you, nosebiter. Kraki laughed, belly rippling with colored tattoos. My water's richer than anything out of the wells of Karakadren. An oath is an oath, said Durin, softly spoken yet deathly serious, as though arguing in his sleep. It is not to be mocked. Kraki jerked his thumb over his shoulder in the direction of the demon slayer. Is he a friend of yours? Snorri pulled up a face. Snorri wouldn't go that far. With a shrug that suggested he had not really cared either way, Kraki helped himself to a chair and deposited his bulk onto it. There he leaned in, as though sharing a secret for Snorri and Durin alone. You speak of Kislev, Kraki boomed, and Snorri winced, wondering if the dwarf thought Snorri couldn't hear properly with one ear. With horror, Snorri wondered how Kraki would sound through two years. And you are not alone, but first you have to worry about getting there. The underway north of here is overrun with beastmen. They even drove the goblins out, bless their evil green hearts. We will clear them, said Durin. Good for you, said Kraki and then mimed a wazak gesture with a finger looping over his temple and returned to Snorri. The manlings kindly allowed the chaos host to march right over them, and now they got nothing better to do than find and break all the underway gates they find. A runesmith led an expedition of iron breakers and slayers under the human fort at Rackspire to reseal the ways, but he was captured by beastmen and carted off to Prague. Or so the survivors of the throng say. He glanced at Drogon, fiercely polishing tankards behind the bar. Wait, said Snorri. What Kraki was saying chimed with something that Durin had been trying to tell him before. What was it again? He scratched the pinhole where his ear had once been, slowly coming to a conclusion so stupid it could have only come from Snorri's own head. Kislev can't have fallen, he said slowly. Kislev men fight almost as well as they drink. Snorri likes them. Kraki smacked the table and barked with laughter. You have been buried in Casa Drengi too long. Here. Give me that throw water they've been feeding you. The slayer took Snorri's mug, and then Durin's too, spreading them apart on the table. With a frown, he bellowed to the bar. Dragon, bring me that old clay tankard, the ghoul ugly one. Kraki waited, drumming his sausage fingers on the table, while the leathery old slayer came crumbling over and stamped the requested vessel onto the table. It was indeed ugly. Gargoyles leered from every side of it, and the handle had been shaped to look like bone. Why anyone had ever made such a thing, Snorri couldn't guess. Now this is Prague, said Kraki, positioning the gargoyle mug in front of him. Obviously, it was sacked months ago by a warlord named Ekold Hellbrass. Only he got pushed out of Prague by some other warlord, leading a horde of trolls, so they say and then continued north. Here he placed his huge palm over Snorri's mug. This one, being piss weak, can be Kislev City. Their queen tried to catch the Chaos Horde as they forded the lower Tobol. 
He shook his head grimly and took his hand back. Hellbrass crushed them. Their city fell soon after. That sounds bad, said Snorri. He liked Kislev. He had some good fights in Kislev and liked their vodka. He did not want to think that it could have been destroyed without him ever realizing the fight even started. And also, he was almost certain that Kislev City had been where Godric had been headed. Does anyone still fight? Kraki sat back, big eyes rolling to indicate the sullen potman behind the bar. The dwarf noticed the attention, but merely grunted and continued to stir his stew. Brock Balderson was on the Tobol crossing that day with a throng of the Kislevite clans. It takes something to drive a dwarf from his home, and Brock won't say much. But it sounds like Hellbrass unleashed a special kind of hell that day. Kraki's eyes lowered, voice dropping to a rumble. Of course, he wasn't a slayer then. And Hellbrass? murmured Durin. What became of him? It's not as if he's got anywhere to go but south, but there's no one left to tell of it. Kraki pointed to Durin's mug. Erengrad, she still stands, but has been essentially annexed by the Empire, and she is on the other side of the Auric Bastion. The what? said Snorri. Now that would take some explaining, Kraki laughed. What matters is it's keeping the enemy good and hot. They got nowhere to go, so there'll be plenty waiting for us once we've cleared the underway. What is here? said Snorri, jabbing his finger into a knot in the table. It fell just short to the left between Kislev and Prague, and just looking at it made Snorri's head feel funny. There is nothing there, said Kraki gently. That's just the table. Try to pay attention, Snorri. Snorri stared at it anyway. You will have the mightiest doom. Spindly brown legs split out into an oak from a dark core. Spiders in the trees. What about Hellbrass? Durin pressed again. Better question, said Kraki leaning back against the chair and grinning like a half-moon. What threw the conqueror of Kislev out of Prague? Prague, thought Snorri, letting the slayer stalk fade into the whistle through his torn ear. It always seemed to come back to Prague. It was a city full of memories, and despite the certainty of battle and death, he found that he was not so eager to return there. Snorri! Kraki's voice dragged him up by his working cauliflower ear. If I didn't know better, I'd say you were looking scared. With a sad grin, Snorri went back to staring at the knot in the table. An old lady standing over him. She's sad. She is angry. Snorri shook his head. Scared? He was outright terrified, and the fact he was not certain why didn't help at all. The image of that dwarf woman and child rose in his thoughts. He could smell burning, feel blood on his hands. He scrunched his eyes and tried to think of something else. There were too many memories, and the priest had been right. Snorri didn't want any of them. The thought of those ghosts following him from Casa Drengi and catching him alone on the wastes of Kislev petrified him far more than dying in shame. Slowly, Snorri unclasped his fingers from around the mug and dragged them to the lip of the table. There, his fingernails crunched into the ancient wood, and he pushed himself until he stood eyeball to eyeball with Kraki Ironhame. His new mace leg thunked against the stone floor. Kraki met Snorri's eyes, his ginger brows lifting questioningly. Snorri wanted a drink. His head ached for the need of it. Without breaking eye contact, Snorri reached for the mug, brought it to his lips, and tossed it back. A shock of mountain water struck the back of his throat. Snorri's eyes widened. His throat tightened in protest, but it was too late. Snorri gave a gargling sound as the dregs drained into his belly. 
And just like that, Cracky began to laugh. That's it, thought Snorri. Snorri has had enough. Muscles bunched through his neck and shoulders and then exploded forward, sending his forehead crashing into Kraki's nose. Blood spattered from the fat slayer's face and he tipped back, spinning on nerveless toes before smashing full on through the end of a table of feasting slayers. The other end of the table swung up, swiping the bowls from under the dwarves' noses and catapulting gravy and ale across the hole. Leaving the shouting dwarves and Kraki's polaxed body to their own devices, Snorri slumped back down into his chair. He wiped a piece of beef gristle from his head. That had not been nearly as satisfying as he had hoped it would be. It seemed that there was nothing for it but to go to Prague and die as quickly and gloriously as was still possible. It was what the old lady had promised, what everyone else seemed to want. Everyone except Snorri, of course. But when did that ever matter? He had always followed others, ever since that first trip into the Chaos Wastes. That had been before he and Gotrek had both become slayers. Before he... His jaw clenched. No, he would not remember that. A proper fight was what he needed. The priest was right about that one too. And at least Kislev was where Gotrek and Felix must be. They had a marvelous knack of being where the fighting was fiercest. They were both just lucky that way. He looked up over the wreckage of the table, heart sinking at the sight of Durin picking his way through it to fetch him another mug of water. He let out a long, resigned breath. The end times couldn't come fast enough.